Okay, um, hello everyone, good afternoon. Um, my name is Dina, as Doug just said, um, and I'm really excited to present to you all the latest iteration of my dissertation project. Um, it's uh, taken a long time, I guess, past two years to get to this current form, and I'm really proud of it, so uh, here goes. Um, in 2014, a United Nations report projected Eritrea to be one of the few countries on the path to meeting the Millennium Development Goals and Health, a set of eight goals established by the United Nations for developing countries facing extraordinary challenges relating to gender equality, education, and health, to name a few. This is surprising because Eritrea is the only African nation that does not accept bilateral assistance from the United States and has refused to adhere to structural readjustment programs since gaining formal independence from Ethiopia in 1991. Eritrea's colonial history begins with the Ottoman Empire in the 16th century, followed by Italy and Great Britain before it was annexed by the UN as the 14th province of monarchical Ethiopia in 1952. After years of civil unrest against colonizing tactics of ruthless Emperor Haile Selassie, Highlanders on Mount Ada began armed struggle in 1961. Warfare lasted for three decades until guerrilla fighters were able to liberate all cities and towns of the Eritrean territory. Up against Ethiopia, which possessed Sub-Saharan Africa's second largest army after South Africa, Eritrean revolutionaries had to develop innovative medical practices in order to manage the masses of casualties as well as evolving ballistic wounds and injuries. This was due to the advanced weaponries provided to Ethiopia by allies like the Soviet Union and the United States. This medical ingenuity began in Orota, the underground hospital in a small rural town called Nakwa. Located in the far off mountains of the Sahel region, Nakwa became the headquarters from which the Eritrean People's Liberation Front operated. It was, a it was a liberated area of Eritrea and a simulatory site for future society. The Nakwa trenches were bustling with schools, armories, and garages, and in 1976, Orota, the birthplace of the first frontline surgery unit. In the mid-70s, the EPLF commissioned Eritrean doctors who had been formally trained at Addis Ababa University, the metropole of Imperial Ethiopia, to train ordinary Eritreans, farmers, mothers, and adolescents as Agar Hakim, or barefoot doctors. This system was an adaptation of the Chinese barefoot doctors program, developed under Cha Chairman Mao Zedong during the Communist Revolution. This healthcare system focused on the socialization of medicine through training of healthcare workers in rural China to provide broader access to care. In line with guerrilla style tactics, EPLF doctors developed clandestine strategies for sharing the Agar Hakim, or barefoot doctors, model effectively training them as combat medics. EPLF doctors, along with Agar Hakim, developed a set of clinical protocols and procedures attending to injury, disability, and the need for long-term rehabilitative treatment. In this project, I am interested in investigating how methods of transmitting medical knowledge amid disaster prototyped contemporary procedures and protocols for clinical practice, especially in places where healthcare provision is poor. How did the theoretical training and technical expertise facilitate, for instance, creative surgical interventions in the face of natural calamities? I am incorporating a mix of archival research, 
semi-structured semi interviews, focus groups, and ArcGIS mapping in order to chart the medical geography of healthcare in Eritrea and build upon existing discourses and gain new insights relating to medical expertise in situations of turmoil, Sino-African relations, especially given Eritrea's continued partnership with the People's Republic of China through the construction of the nation's largest hospital, located uh, today in the capital city of Asmara. It was actually named Orota Hospital after the underground hospital at Nakwa. Uh, and finally, building on conceptions of the relationship between statecraft and nation building, medicine and science and scientific expertise. Um, and so through my project, I guess the next step of my project will be continuing to locate um, uh, veteran Agar Hakaim or combat medics, medical doctors, um, as well as veteran physicians and patients who were treated in the underground hospital um, and other underground hospitals throughout the Eritrean territory. Um, and these photos here were actually, these archival photos um, were taken in the 1980s by a photographer named Fritz Eisenlofel, who was a Dutch uh, photojournalist, and he was actually commissioned to take these photographs by the EPLF in order to document life um, and uh, the strategies used for uh, survival and sort of nation building during this time. So uh, um, thank you for listening, and I'm excited to hear any feedback or questions, uh, comments you may have. as is practiced in other sort of war situations? Yeah, I mean, what, what, what do you think is the broader historical framing of what you're observing? Yeah, I think that um, on the one hand, what my project contributes to is how we might understand war medicine, um, which there uh, isn't as much anthropological work on. Um, and then on the other hand, also how we might think of um, how medicine might be used and uh, how medicine is studied anthropologically for its future use. Um, one of the things that oftentimes I kind of hear whenever I talk about my project is that, you know, this is a very exceptional situation and uh, clinicians, for instance, might not need to know about this kind of information, but um, I would argue that uh, this is still something that's very possible today, and that's why this project is in, important for us to really mine. Mm -hmm. How are you um, going to be thinking through more broadly the relationship between contemporary Chinese capital investment in Africa and then this coming out of a longer history of sort of social friendship? I mean, what, um, how do you situate this with yeah, I really like that question because um, one of the things that's really interesting about how the government of Eritrea does uh, foreign policy or makes um, deals with, with these um, foreign investors is that um, they require foreign investors in after making a deal with, with the government to um, only do so if they leave their equipment in Eritrea when they're done, and they're, all their tools, and and, um, and also Eritreans are required to, to do the actual labor. Um, and so thinking about how unique, first of all, the um, colonial history of Eritrea is to begin with in terms of <laughs> it being most recently colonized by another African country, I think that this sort of uh, complicates 
how we might think of colonialism in Africa more, more, more broadly, um, and also what it might look like to think about um, how Africa or how countries in Africa um, or other developing countries um, in the world today might do business with uh, the People's Republic of China. So um, it's just a fascinating situation. I'm wondering about deeper historical continuities in medical practice, and do you have any access to you know, how that may influence what actually developed during the period of the, the, uh, the revolt? Yeah. Um, one of the things that's really fascinating about charting this medical uh, history is actually the fact that prior to the mid-70s, wherein um, this underground system um, began, uh, there was no organized way of doing medicine. And uh, guerrilla fighters were dependent on traditional ways of uh, knowing as it related to medicine. Um, and some of that is sort of tied into ideas of um, witchcraft, what we might call witchcraft, or um, sort of like religious practices. Um, and that's something that today uh, people in Eritrean society are trying to grapple with, uh, is uh, the balance between more biomedical approaches um, versus what a lot of people still deeply believe are um, traditional sort of ways of healing. Um, and so it's interesting to tease out when the call to commission these um, sort of more f formally educated physicians um, occurred. Yes, and then yes. Um, so I'm really excited about um, what Andrea was, was asking you, but it's not really a question more, it's just kind of a comment about it. You had looked um, towards the contemporary situation in Colombia, where the demobilized gorillas, um, so all the medical practitioners who are trying to actually get officially recognized that they're that they were nurses and they were doctors in a, in a war and all the difficulties that are happening um, for that sustained recognition for them to take the exams, for instance, to get their nursing degrees recognized and things like this. Um, but there's also a student, um, I don't know if you've come across her work, she's finishing her dissertation right now um, at York in science studies with anthropology, who is her dissertation is on her medicine, her war medicine in Colombia, um, particularly on the same kinds of things that you were drawing on about in particular, and the way that the strategies to develop to combat that in the jungle were all built around indigenous practices. Anyways, and that's a part where we're, we're learning from. And then um, the, the U.S. the military um, that did not allow the medication to be circulating outside of the military hospitals mm -hmm. for the, the civilian population that are all affected by the similar disease. Anyways, there's some interesting things I could be yeah, thank you so much for that, um, for your comment and uh, for wanting to connect me um, with this person. The other thing that's interesting um, that relates more um, to the contemporary, how I, I'm trying to link the historical to the contemporary with uh, medicine in Eritrea today and healthcare in Eritrea today is that. Um, in 2009, the UN sanctioned, uh, put, put sanctions on um, on Eritrea, and so that really limited, um, just I mean, definitely the the economic uh, the situation, but also the ability for um, Eritreans to acquire raw materials, mm -hmm. um, and and so during the uh, underground hospital sort of um, era. Uh, there was also an underground pharmaceutical laboratory, uh, laboratories where people were, where they were manufacturing actually um, penicillin and other types of antibiotics. And so that led to a standstill in the possibilities of being able to produce, uh, you know, medicines um, in, in the country. And so that also complicated the situation of healthcare um, as it is today. And so recently the sanctions were lifted, and so this is sort of a new time for us to see where things will go. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Oh.